so we're all good. So we'll just give it another minute. Um, do want to be too on time? Um, known for being a little bit early, so that's fine. So all good. Um, we should be fine. So most people have logged in, so that's good. So thank you for joining the second webinar in the series. Um, this is the management of the older competition horse. So this, the type of horse I'm talking about is maybe your high level horse that's doing Grand Prix show jumping or World Cup show jumping or a four star eventer or even a three star eventer. But equally, a lot of these, the comments are very aimed at horses that might be schoolmasters and you're managing those to ensure longevity. And this is all what it's about. It's about dealing with the horses in looking at the longevity of them and manage them long term. So hope you enjoy it. And any questions, again, you can ask them um, as we go along and I will try to answer them as I go. So there will be a recording of this, which I will release in about two weeks time. So thank you very much. And we'll get going from here. So when we're considering the older horse, the category of horse I'm talking about is a horse that's maybe, you know, 11, 12 years of age um, and above, and you're trying to deal with them to manage, to maximize the potential for that horse. So some of the things we're talking about is joint management during the, the webinar, foot management for the older horse, that's very important. Um, metabolic diseases, you're gonna actually have to start dealing with um, horse health problems. So often we very lucky in horses up until they're about 10, 11, 12, we don't have to deal with many um, systemic diseases then that have to be managed long-term. So we're talking about those chronic diseases. And then um, exercise management, I have left out dental for this one because I've had so many questions regarding exercise management that I really wanted to spend enough time in all these different areas and I had to limit it or else we'll be here for a couple of hours. So I've stuck with exercise management. And then the final point, which is never something we want to consider is when is retirement the correct thing? I'll just touch upon that at the end and we'll, you'll see how we, we touch on that as we go. So. Hope everyone's enjoying it and you're all signed in. That's great and we'll keep going. So with joint disease, the one thing I accept is no older horse is 100% signed. You can't expect those horses to be signed. They've all got issues they've been managing at some point. So this x-ray here, if you can see, has got a chip in a fetlock joint. Now this horse is a 13 year old eventer. It's had no problems, right? It's had no problems until this stage of its life. We've known about that fragment for four or five years uh, because it was vetted for sale and didn't sell because of it. Uh, the horse has gone on and it has been fine, but it's starting to become an issue. It's starting to irritate that. So it's like having a stone in your shoe. Eventually it's going to cause a problem. Um, so it's about assessment over time. So this is the limbless locator here. Um, you'll see two plots of this horse. This is a horse trotting in a straight line. This is a Grand Prix dressage horse. Um, you can see we have an occasional right force. So when we look at these for people who haven't seen them, each blue line up here is a stride. The red is your average. If your red falls within inside that circle, it's pretty good. We're right on the boundary there. So a mild right four, and we've got left hind problems developing as well. So this is this horse, I'm tracking this horse. The, the time difference between these two trot ups is two months. I haven't done any treatment because I'm accepting that not every horse is 100% and as much as I aim for perfection you sometimes have to live with what you've got and not be too uh, invasive in management of these horses so this horse is on a management program to help his joints but it's staying pretty static and this horse is in full work and working hard and competing and I'm not overly concerned so um, the other thing this is a horse it's got a medial hind suspensory. So anyone that's deal, dealt with a hind suspensory ligament, they'll often cause chronic lameness and be very troublesome to manage. This horse is showing no lameness, but it's got an ugly suspensory branch. The horse is competing Grand Prix dressage and competing very well. And so it is one of those things you have to just accept. Um, so let's... Um, Back one, so sorry. So we're dealing with all tendon injuries, multiple limbs and joint issues. So those are something we have to manage um, and we have to accept in this older horse. It's about tinkering. It's the best way I describe it. It's like tinkering with an old car. You've got to just do fine tuning and fine management of it. So, so sorry, shouldn't have gone backwards. So 
when I'm dealing with an older horse or the more competition horse, I'm initial my initial approach for management of these, even when I see them for the first time, is I take a holistic approach. I look at the entire horse. So I'm with that there in mind, we're dealing with your pendazans, your HAs, uh, the joint foods and stuff like that there. So what, do you, what are we using? Um, look, I personally use Arthropen as a brand. It's pendazan as well. And, and part of that, I'll be very honest, is a cost. It's, it's a cheaper product um, than the traditional pendazan. And so my buying power as a result, I can get it a bit cheaper and it's cheaper to the client. So with this here, one thing I will say, the tradition for pendazan has been six mils, okay? Six mils is for a 500 kilogram horse. Not being rude, I don't know. I don't know everyone who's on this webinar. I guarantee you, if you're riding an adult, uh, uh, riding a horse that's greater than 16 hands, majority of them are bigger than 500 kilograms, okay? 500 kilograms is a thoroughbred weight, a lightweight thoroughbred. Um, so you really need to be dosing them properly. So it's eight mils. I'm using eight mils a lot of times. Sometimes I'm using nine, sometimes I'm using 10, depending on the horse. This drug is, you've got to use it based on the weight of your horse. I know it costs you more, you've got a bigger horse, it costs more to feed generally. Okay, so you've got to use it that there. How often am I using it? No, me personally, everyone's got their own plan. So when I initially start to see a, a lame older horse, what am I going to do? I'm going to put it on a weekly course for four weeks to see how it responds to that there. I'll then try and push it out to once a month but often I'll be bringing it back a bit shorter than that for those higher level horses or horses that have got chronic issues. Um, it works well. It's a really beneficial treatment to use and I do like it. So I would tend to use that there on a weekly basis. So at a very high level, um, you, horses that are competing World Cup show jumping or Grand Prix dressage or high level eventing or got really bad limbs issues that respond well to this, we might even be going weekly all the time. And I know that's a big cost, but it, it really does. If it works for your horse, it's very useful. So some of the high level horses I'll be on weekly for this year. Um, word of warning, two weeks before competition, stop it. Not because of swapping time, not because anything like that, is occasionally they get a reaction in the muscle. So they'll occasionally get a muscle reaction and you have to be aware of that. And I don't want you to miss a competition because of that. A stupid thing, like a horse getting a reaction to pentazan, I don't want that to happen. So I'll stop two weeks out. So if you're competing, you know, you know when to do it. You want to give it time. So if you do get a reaction, we'll stop using it. Okay. Okay. So someone's just asked, at what age would you start a horse on joint injections? Look, it's a little bit of a hard question. And I, I, and I say that, so I'll explain my answer. Um, the the when I start management of these horses is I wouldn't be starting a four year old, five year old, six year old on it unless they're in high level work. So I'm always clarifying that. Um, the it depends on the work level. So obviously a six-year-old that's going for an example, a six-year-old dressed as with the stars, it's basically competing almost medium pre St. George. Um, so that horse there, I might be starting it on some management, but if the horse is still doing elementary, I would be advising you to spend more money with your farrier or spending money on your x-rays to make sure the feet are right. Cause that's a great time to work on them. We'll talk about that later. Um, and I'd hold off until they're in higher level work or you're starting to get a few issues. So hope that answers it uh, for you. Um, and just a couple of people that maybe joined a little bit e easier uh, uh, later. Um, an older horse we're classifying as 10 or 10 or 11, 12 plus. Um, so hope that answers for you. Um, Okay, so let's keep going. So, oh God, I keep pressing the wrong button. I do apologize for this. So, um, HA, um, I use the brand Matrix. Again, it's from, it's from Land Lab. I um, use their products quite a lot. And again, it's a cost benefit. Um, it's quite an affordable product. I know there's many different ones on the market. I tend to stick to one brand. Um, and I just use that there. So I use that there intravenously. Now that there I might use in a younger horse and start using it um, 
you know, a five-year-old, six-year-old. Um, I would be using that this here for a five, six-year-old probably once every two to three months. Now, when we get into the older horses, I'd probably be up to monthly, to be honest, if they've got issues um, that we're trying to manage. I will be using this here um, to help them. Now, I, um, some people may think that's a bit aggressive, but if I can avoid, avoid injecting the joint in an older horse, I'll try and avoid it if I can um, for multiple reasons, which we'll touch on later. So that's my HIA. Um, I will use it in combination with Pentazan for the uh, right condition, condition, and there's no reason why you can't use both together. Okay, big topic, joint foods. So. Okay, so two questions um, that I'm gonna answer here. Um, a couple of questions here. So good question here from uh, Lady. If you had to choose between Pentazan or HA, what would, what would you choose or do a combination? Look, it depends on the horse. If it's a younger horse, so in that eight, nine, 10 category, I might do a course of Pentazan at the once a week. Um, once a year, just to help the horse out, and then use EHA in between. Um, I don't find Pendazan very useful just running on it once a month or once every two months. It's a concentration dependent drug, and you need to be using it at that level and getting the concentration high in the body. So I hope that answers the question there. Um, another question, have you had seen any allergic reaction to Pendazan? No, I have. I personally have not. I've known of a horse that has died from Pendazan, yes. Pendazan should be given intramuscularly, should not be given intravenous. With any drugs, there are occasional, um, there are occasional horses that have reactions to it, unfortunately. Um, and so that's um, what we you, you do get the occasional horse that will get a problem like that there. So hope that answers it. Right. No, um, H is HA, IV, or intraarticular? Um, you can use it both ways. Um, obviously, it's intraarticular, it's vet only. Intravenous, you can do it yourself if you can do intravenous. I use it intravenous as a management, how I'm talking about there. So, HA is hyaluronic acid. Um, and I hope that answers a couple of questions there. So, um, I'll move on. So, there's one question I which I'll leave for a minute. Um, so, joint foods, what are we talking about? We're talking about the chondroitin sulfates, your epitalis. We could, there's, a, there's a realm of them. Um, people that know me and clients in the practice will know that I, as a general rule, don't recommend them very a lot. And, and, and that's for a couple of reasons, I'm really being honest. One is when I know I use Pentazan and HA and I've got a problem, I find I want to recommend something that 70 to 80% of the time is going to have a positive effect on your horse. It may not fix it completely, but it's a positive effect on your horse. So with the other joint foods, I've seen some horses jump out of the ground with them and I've seen some horses have no response at all when we've got problems. Um, epitalis in fairness to them, have done the most research behind their product. So I would commend them on that. I think there's still some more work to be done. It's very hard to do studies on arthritis models in everyday life other than you know, creating a chip in the knee and, and studying it that way. I think that's very hard. So I think in fairness to them, they've done the best job they possibly can. They have done good research. It seems to be a product that a lot of horses respond to. Um, I'm not, I haven't done enough to compare and contrast to sort of be comfortable saying would I use Pentazan versus Epitalis. Um, I'm probably a bigger user of Pentazan than Epitalis, to be honest. Um, you can buy it anywhere, but we don't sell a lot of Epitalis, even though we're very price competitive with everyone. Um, we, I, I tend not to push it a lot. And so I use Pentazan more because I know the response I get and I find it really useful. Um, so that's my take on joint food. So I'm sorry if I've disappointed people not talking more about it. Um, so um, two, two questions uh, Two questions I'm gonna answer here. Is AHA step two for a horse who's been on pentazan is not responding as well anymore or is it step one? 
Look, it depends on the situation, to be honest. Um, depending on what I've got going on, if I think I've got an inflamed joints, I'll tend to use the HI. So inflamed joints, you get puffy fetlocks or something like that there. HI, I think, is better for that there. HI is working as the hyaluronic acid. HI is what I'm talking about. Sorry for shortening all the time. I'm becoming an Australian. Sorry, Australian love. Guys love shortening things. So um, hyaluronic acid is a component of joint fluid. It's what gives the joint fluid its bounce, its thickness. It's, and so when you get an inflamed joint, the concentration of HA within the joint decreases. And so that's the, the thought or process behind giving it. Um, I think there's more that we really, if we're really honest, we don't understand. It has other positive effects, but has anti-inflammatory. And so it's very, it's very good there. Um, so I, it would depend on the situation. So Pendazan works really well. I like it. And it will, it's mix and match depending on the case. Okay, so we, um, there are oral HA supplements on the market. Would you bother? Okay, this is an interesting one. There is actually only one study being published that I'm aware of, and I've done a bit of research leading up to this, of the benefits of HA oral HA administration to a horse, okay? So it's a big molecule, and not we're not convinced that horses can absorb it really well, so it is something that you have to be, if you want to try it, I have no, I have no hesitations, clients that know me, um, happy to try things and see if they have a positive effect. Um, we, we seem to have had a lot of people when HA, oral HA came out um, initially, it was, we dropped off given intravenous hyaluronic acid. Um, it's now come back, we're doing a lot more intravenous hyaluronic acid. I think that's just clients that find it's not working as well with oral products. So hope that answers it for you. Um, so would you recommend starting injecting before lameness or only when lameness is noticed? Um, Look, I'd advise monitoring, to be honest, and that's why I invested in the lameness locator to monitor these horses at a high level to assess what goes on. So I hope that answers your... So, yeah, I hope that answers. So it depends on the horse. Um, none of the products, and this is um, probably break the internet moment, um, none of the products have actually been shown to categorically prevent lameness developing. I know lameness is a swear word to you guys. I understand that completely. Um, closely followed by the N word, navicular, if you don't know me. Um, but yeah, so um, that's it. So yeah, look, it depends on the horse and depends on the workload. So the more workload you're getting up, sometimes we might start to have changes in joints and that's where engage in your vet to have a look at your horse and actually examine your horse and look for effusions that you might miss. Um, because that's my job, to look for effusions. I can't help it. I see it always walk past me to show. I look for swellings in legs. That's just part of me, unfortunately. Um, so does HA swab? No, HA does not swab. Um, it doesn't have a swabbing time. So I hope that answers the question. So I've talked pre we've talked previously about holistic management of joints. So I'll talk you through a little bit of my management thought process behind the management of some joints in these older horses. So first presented, we identified multiple issues. I may try, if there's only one joint involved, I'll be probably keener to go to a joint injection where I'm going to deal with a specific joint. If there's multiple joints involved, I may, I may well recommend we start a pendazan course, alter training to allow it to have an effect, and then come back and re-examine and deal with specific joints. So for the, for the reason for that is I don't want to be giving multiple joint injections if I can avoid it and I can manage that and hold it up my sleeve for down the track. So when I'm going to joint disease, I'm, there's two types of joints that I'm aware, you're, you're aware of. And um, there's the high motion joints. So those are your fetlocks, your stifles, your coffin joints. They're moving constantly, right? So every time the horse moves, they're moving, they're quite aggressive. Then you've got your low motion joints. So this is a high motion joint of the fetlock that's getting changed on the capsular attachment up here at the end of the cannon bone. So the joint capsule attaches up there and attaches down there. This horse has got a very tight joint. It's, it's getting tight. It's not 
flexing as well, and, and we're noting that on, on exercise. Um, this horse had a fetlock, little fetlock chip there, you can see, and so it's still high motion. So now we move into your pasterns. Believe it or not, pasterns are low motion joints. So this horse has a cyst in the pastern, he's getting some changes on the outside of the joint. Um, because there's instability there's in, since due to this cyst and there's some changes happening in this, the collateral ligaments of the fetlock joint, of that coffin, pastern joint, sorry. And then you've obviously got your hock joints, your lower hock joints. So this is the tarsocrural joint, the most common joint for um, an OCD lesion. So that's where you'd see a puffy hock. Um, the tarsal metatarsal joint and the distal of the tarsal joint, so tarsal metatarsal, so it's the metatarsal cannon bone, and the distant tarsal joint, the two most common joints of arthritis in the hock. They are low motion joints, they don't move, they rub. So when you're asking a horse to sit behind, this is the joint, they're going like that there. Often there are changes at the, at the front of the joint, um, and that's where we get new bone. This horse is actually going through diffusion at the minute. It's, it's trying to fuse its joints itself. Okay, um, when we talk about joint um, individual joint management, there's a couple of things I consider before we, we talk about the different choices. Um, Okay, so um, someone just, I'll answer this question. Someone just asked a question. Do you recommend limbs assessment on a regular basis and how often or just when issues arrive? Look, um, I think for a younger horse, once a year is fine as part of a roadworthy certificate type thing when you're looking at feet and taking feet x-rays. As you're getting up the grades and you're getting higher levels, I, I think you need to be more aggressive in your management and assess and assessing those horses because they almost become priceless. Let's be honest, you know, replacing those good schoolmasters, they're hard to replace. Now, if you can pick up, I'll be really honest, if I can pick up a lameness that's gone from, as I showed the, the early slide where we're tracking an older horse, if I can pick that horse up when he goes from just not quite right, maybe one out of 15, and heading across to, uh, you know, one out of 10, which, may not seem much and you think, oh, well, do we worry about that? And it's, or it's starting to creep up. If I can treat that at that level as an individual joint management, it's going to respond so much better than when you present it to me and it's two out of five limbs. So there's older horses I would recommend sort of building into your management um, of how you assess those horses long-term. So especially once you get up the grades, I think you know, in the early years, I think once a year is a perfectly healthy um, time to assess them unless you're concerned. And then after that, I think you need to be a little bit more regular. So uh, once a month, maybe an overkill depending, but for even, even when we think about Grand Prix dressage horses in Australia, there's really a season where you guys are competing. And same with the eventers. And show jumpers, you've got a bit of a longer season, but there is off time. So during the off time, you probably don't need to assess, but maybe assess at the end of the competition season. There's anything you need to do to put in place while they're having a break, that you're doing that there, Grand Prix dressage horses, you know, once you've got over your break, your nationals, and you've got a bit of a break before you, you've climbed back into after Christmas, assess them for them, put in place your management. So I hope that answers the question. So, um, things to consider when I'm talking about joint management, uh, individual joints, uh, history of metabolic disease, which we'll cover a little bit later, history of laminitis, that's really important. Um, and also, is there any tendon ligament issues involved with that there? So an example of that there is a tarsal metatarsal joint of a hock, and we've got a tarsal metatarsal joint, and we've got a proximal suspensory problem going on behind, okay? So those are a couple of things we need to consider and we need to be aware of, and you need to make your vet. You know, if you're calling someone new in and you've had laminitis or there's been a query about metabolic, please be honest, because it does make a difference in what we do. Um, because that, that's one scary word there, laminitis, it really is. Um, and especially for warm bloods, it, it's, it's, it's really severe. So, um, with your joint injections, so we've, we've two types, basically, we split up into two types. You've got your corticosteroids, uh, your cortisones, and you've got your biologics, we'll call them. Okay, so cortisone is still the most commonly used um, treatment. What is it? And what's it doing to your joint? Someone emailed the question. So cortisone is purely an anti-inflammatory, nothing else. It's just an anti-inflammatory. We're not, we're just taking inflammation out of the joint. We're not fixing anything. We're not healing anything. We're just 
taking the information on. Now it's a very useful treatment. And I say that because it can come across wrong. You think, oh, well, it's not doing anything. It is doing something. It's, it's reducing the information in that joint. Um, if you can do that there, a lot of these horses will be fine. So example is a horse in a tarsal metatarsal joint of the hock. Cortisone is a very, very good drug. Really good drug, really good drug to use. And, it, and you might get six to 12 months out of each treatment. Um, and that's really good. So one of the things with it is though, it can cause laminitis. If your horse is prone to laminitis and you're giving cortisone, you have to be careful. So warm bloods are very prone to laminitis um, after cortisone. Very prone, we say, we say that, but it's just more prone than a thoroughbred. So a thoroughbred is a lot more tolerant of cortisone and can cope with the bigger dosages. Um, the warm bloods, my advice, if, so an example is if you've got a horse that's got um, low grade hock issues, and we've got cough and joint problems, okay? So, and we're gonna use cortisone. I'll be splitting the doses up. So I might come one day and do the hocks, give it two or three weeks, come back and do the cough and joints. And the reason for that is, I probably don't wanna put in much more than 12 or 14 milligrams of tramacinolone, which is the drug I would use, which is long enough acting, but not, too, not that severe on the cartilage. Um, it's got a two week withholding period for hawks, 78 days for coffin joints. I will use, I'll split the dose. So the horse will get a total 24 milligrams over the course of a month, but we'll get 12 milligrams for both hawks and 12 milligrams for both coffin joints down the track. So hope that answers the question. Um, a joint infection. The joint infection is a real risk. Um, it's in a very low percentage for most very for free equine vets. We're yeah, 0.00% type region, but it is potentially life threatening and needs aggressive therapy. So always wary of that. Um, you know, if some some people have known, I've maybe said no, I'm not happy to do it today because the leg's filthy, the ground's filthy, and we're not in a great environment. In which case, it's better just to come back and do it another day. Save it for another day. Don't get a joint infection. It will flatten your horse. Some horses go a bit flat after it, and you have to be aware of it. Um, so for that, I mean, they might go off their feed for a couple of days. Usually peaks around three to four days after cortisone treatment. You will see horses go a little bit flat um, off their feed occasionally. Just keep an eye on them. We, we've seen it multiple times and, and we can track them through what they're doing and you just got to take it easy and let them come come around after it and it's just a central effect um i know for myself i had cortisone into a thumb joint after trying to sever my thumb off and it um i slept for a week god i felt like i felt like i you know been running I, was, I hadn't slept for two years because i was that tired it's also got a swapping time and um, which you have to be aware of so um please advise your vet when you're going to compete to get them in trouble. Okay, question. Um, if a young racehorse has had its joints injected, will it affect its performance later in life once retired from racing? Um, the joint injection itself won't, won't have a negative effect on the horse. So the cortisones we use nowadays, the trimacinolones or the betamethasone, Celestone is the brand name, they are quite kind to a joint. Um, some research coming out saying we need to be aware of the dosages we're giving and um, but most of us are heading to lesser dose rather than more but most of the issues coming out of racing will be what damage has been done to the joint not the joint injection causing it maybe the joint injections facilitated the horse to do more work but it wouldn't specifically have that problem um, then we're looking at our biologics uh, these are really good group of treatments um, currently we're sort of working We've got IRAP and PRP in the clinic. Um, PRP, I mean platelet-rich plasma. IRAP is interleukin re receptor antagonist protein, um, called IRAP for short. They're both blood-based treatments, okay? Um, different ways of doing things and, and different effects that we'll be using them for. So my IRAP, this is the IRAP syringe. We collect about 50 mils of blood from a horse. We incubate it for 24 hours, spin it down and get rid of all these red blood cells. And we've got all this serum. It can then be injected back into the joints. Um, we split it up and we can freeze it. So you get multiple, multiple treatments out of each collection. Um, really useful for horses that have got it can be useful even a young horse, a young horse that you rate highly, that gets puffy fetlocks and you want to try and deal with them. This is a really good way to, to deal with it. Um, PRP is really useful if you have got um, maybe a ligament in the foot 
issue, sort of like a collateral ligament of a, of a coffin joint that's coming through, that will go through the coffin joint itself. Um, this is a really useful treatment, really like it. And um, both of these I, I find really useful and really have changed what we can do now for these horses. So IRAP would be my go-to for my older horses that might have some metabolic issues that I'm trying to avoid using cortisone because I don't want to induce the laminitis. So you've got to think about that. Um, and the PRP, again, a really good, good useful question, useful thing. So. Okay, question. Um, a couple of questions here before we move on to the next. I'll just deal with that. Um, would you commence injections prior or post symptoms? And this is, I assume, it came back from when we were talking about Pendazan. I would personally just wait until you have some symptoms, um, unless you maybe consider using HA once every three months, something like that. There, that would that would be good. Um, would you use or recommend hydrogels? Okay, so hydrogels, we're talking about a product called Arthromid. It's on the market. Um, I have used a lot of it in racing. Um, I suppose I've seen quite good results with it at times, and I've seen other results that have been a bit middling. So I've stuck more with the IRAPs. I find them more useful um, because AI wrap, we get more collect more treatments out of each collection. So I've got more in the freezer. So if your horse down the track has a flare up of a joint or something that I need to treat, I've got it in the freezer ready to go. So quite like that there. So personally, I've used the hydrogel a lot in um, has involved in the licensing study, and we injected quite a lot of horses with it to see the effect on it. And look, it, it seemed to work. It seemed to work quite well. I think it is a good, useful treatment for the right horse. So hope that answers your question. Okay, 